Okay, a, good, a very good morning and a warm welcome to all the participants of the Asia Pacific Intensive Care Symposium 2020. My name is Mei Fang and I'm an anesthesiologist from the Department of Anesthesiology, Surgical Intensive Care and Pain Medicine at Tan Tock Seng Hospital. We have an exciting lineup uh, of speakers to share about their experience and expertise. Uh, the theme this morning is ARDS management and what has changed with COVID-19. And it's my pleasure this morning to introduce our three expert speakers for today. Dr. Dirk Varuman, Assistant Professor Ramanathan and Professor Gianfranco Majuri. Um, before we start, just a couple of things to highlight. Uh, we will first start with a 25-minute talk by each speaker, and they have kindly offered to take questions from the floor for about five minutes or so uh, at the end of each of their talks. So uh, to the audience, uh, feel free to ask the questions via the Q&A function in the Zoom screen. Uh, when you hover over to the Zoom screen, you'll be able to type your comments and questions, and uh, they will be answered at the end of the talk. Um, so first up, to kick off the session, our first guest today is Dr. Dirk Varman. Uh, just a brief introduction, Dr. Varman is a cardiac anesthesiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and an assistant professor of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School in Boston. He has special interest in cardiac anesthesia and cardiac critical care. After completing medical school at the University of Bonn, Dr. Weirman was awarded a doctorate degree in medicine in 2004 and has been heavily involved in research since. He is also involved in the development of pathways for enhanced recovery after cardiac surgery, or ERAS for short, to improve the perioperative care and outcomes of cardiac patients requiring heart surgery. A very well-regarded mentor in the community and known for his passion in critical care medicine, he is also involved in the care of patients with COVID-19 infection in the Special Pathogen Intensive Care Unit with extensive experience with ARDS patients. Um, he will be speaking about the use of awake proning in the management of COVID ARDS. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Varman. Hi. Uh, I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see my screen. Um, I'm delighted to be invited to this conference and to present um, aspects of treating ARDS and COVID patients and I'm particularly focusing on awake proning of those patients. It's a picture of our hospital. It's in Boston. For, cha for change, there's no snow this time. Um, on this picture. These are my disclosures that I have to make. And also I have two kids in college and I'm looking actually for more conflict of interest. So a little look back on the history, um, especially this presentation is very um, US or somewhat US centric. Um, we haven't had um, that many pandemics I mean, nobody really has that many pandemics, but a lot of countries have been much harder hit, by example, for the, um, by SARS in 2003. There were 8,000 cases in the entire world, according to the World Health Organization. But in the US, there were only eight cases with laboratory, laboratory evidence of the coronavirus that's causing the um, SARS disease. In 2009, with H1N1, the, or the swine flu, actually in Massachusetts, um, we had almost 2,000 cases, according to the local Department of Public Health, of which about 20% uh, or 400 cases were hospitalized. And of those, only 33 died, which is very fortunately. So we have some experience with um, acute respiratory uh, distress syndromes, but how did it pan out with COVID? What's happening in COVID? And I'm giving you a little overview of what we had here at in Boston at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, BWH. Um, 
there are actually multiple hospitals in Boston. The Brigham Women's is one of the bigger teaching hospitals of the Harvard Medical School. There's another bigger hospital, it's uh, Massachusetts General, but there's also the, the BI, as Children's Hospital, focusing on children's. There's Tufts University, Boston Medical Center. So we are not the only center who is dealing with um, COVID in Boston, but we are one of the we are one of the bigger ones with about 800 beds. So in the beginning of March, on the 2nd of March, we actually um, encountered the first presumed COVID case in Massachusetts. There was this Amgen conference here where it turned out to be, in retrospect, a super spreader event um, from which COVID-19 basically spread into the community. A couple of weeks later from this first case, we actually had the first case admitted to our hospital. And just a week later, we actually initiated dedicated COVID ICU or, or SPIC use, special pathogen, uh, pathogen intensive care units. These units were actually in a, in a building that was usually used. They were for um, patients after cardiac surgery, cardiology patients. It's called the Shapiro building, the building that you saw in the initial um, picture. This building was completely converted to negative airflow and we opened one unit with 18 beds with negative airflow in single patient's rooms. And we formed speaker teams that consisted of an ICU attending, an ICU fellow, and one to two residents or physician assistants. So this was on the 20th. And you can see here, we started on the 20th with like in the morning, two patients, then four patients. And another couple of weeks later, basically we had a 20 fold increase in patients. 38 patients doesn't seem that much, but I can tell you another two weeks later, we had a, this is ICU patients, only ICU patients. We had about hundred patients in the ICU. That actually poses some problems. So, if you all of a sudden have to isolate patients and you have to don it off, that needs heroic efforts from the nursing staff, from, uh, from physician assistants, from teams. Um, so we actually scheduled that we had eight teams that were eight ICU teams that were taking care of patients. They were all color coded, starting with a team green, team yellow, team blue, team brown, team silver, exotic co colors, then team crimson, team teal. And we actually ran into the problem that our resources, even being a developed country or a WHO level four country, we ran into problems like lack of PPEs, even lack of regular face masks, lack of ABG syringes. So our patients in the ICU could not get um, as much as, as, as many ABGs as we would like to draw. And also then there was a predictive shortage of ventilators. New York was spearheading um, as a hotspot where more than um, 30,000 patients basically died within weeks. And they had problems that dug into the um, national stockpiles to just get mechanical ventilators. This is what you see. There's a critical ventilator shortage in New York. Device manu manufacturers couldn't uh, keep up. There's also then uh, talks about other companies like car manufacturers making ventilators. Actually, Tesla developed a very workable prototype that actually didn't make it into the market as far as I know, but it was very capable. It was made from Tesla Model 3 parts. But also then, as we were pretty afraid of putting any patients on non-invasive ventilation, for example, for um, the perceived risk that we are infecting, that we are infecting our staff. But some doctors were actually moving away from ventilators for virus patients. The outcome, the initial mortality for ventilated patients in New York was reported at 60 to 80 percent. So, like I said, early data from New York City reported a mortality rate for ventilated patients with COVID in the ICU of around 80 percent. Four out of five patients died on a ventilator. So plans in the US, Massachusetts, also in New York were made for a crisis triage. So there's a crisis, stand, crisis standard of care that was um, proposed from leaders in the medical field and it was actually um, accepted by the Department of Public Health. New York tapped into the national stockpile in terms of equipment, ventilators, and people really become innov became innovative. There were groups developing ventilators. There were ideas of ventilator splitting that was actually discouraged by most of critical care um, societies because of the way it was um, suggested how to do it. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's much more complicated than it's oftentimes depicted. 
we actually repurpose non-invasive ventilator for invasive ventilation at our hospital. We are thinking about using anesthesia machines. We developed a development of new devices, ventilation um, back squeezers. The problem is if you use standard equipment, for example, that squeezes and boo bags or ventilation bags, you run off the, out of those bags. If you create something very complex, um, like a me mechanical ventilator, you need pressure transducers. And actually, there were none on the market anymore in the US. There were so many people developing ventilators that differential pressure transducers were unavailable. And there's also what we saw a lot in Italy is like the in use of non-invasive ventilation using helmet CPAP. CPAP. There's, it has been used across town at Tufts University, but they also found out that training staff in using helmet CPAP, which they have never used, in the emergency situation is actually something that's really complicated and very staffing intensive. So looking at the data again, the mortality of COVID patients requiring mechanical ventilation, the early data from Wuhan actually, where this, from where the virus spread, is more than, it's like 85 to 97%. That is an unheard mortality for um, ARDS, even severe ARDS. In the US right now, it's somewhere between reported in multiple centers about um, one third to three quarters of the patients pass away on a ventilator. And looking at established te uh, therapies for ARDS, right now what is really evidence-based, proven for ARDS is mainly lung protective ventilation with limiting to tidal volume to about six milliliters per, to, per kilogram predicted body weight. The early use of neuromuscular blockers, specifically cis articurium for 48 hours um, with Dr. Papazian spearheading the first study published in the New England Journal and prone positioning. And this is actually what I will focus on. So prone positioning is not a totally new concept. Extreme changes of positions in ARDS were first described um, in 1976. That is 50, almost 50 years ago. It was a small case series with five, with five ARDS patients that were actually put in a bed specifically made for putting patients into different position, also capable of putting them into a prone position. It's called the circle electric bed. It was manufactured by a company uh, called Stryker. That company still is producing a lot of medical equipment. The finding was by Margaret Peel is that it actually improved the PAO2, which was thought to be on a, based on an, or caused by an improvement in the um, VQ matching, sorry, not VA, but VQ matching. It actually facilitated bronchial alveolar toilet, and it has actually, lo and behold, believe it or not, it was found enthusiastic acceptance by the nursing team because it could be relatively easily done. Then there are other, then there came CT studies of ARDS, which actually show a non homogeneous ventilation. Um, there are increased densities in the most dependent areas on the lung mostly imposed by gravity of a really wet lung, where the weight of the lung itself compresses the most dependent areas and the most dependent alveoli. Then there's this seminal paper by Gattinoni in intensive care from 1986 that has described the baby lung concept that you have just a very small part of the lung still ventilated and actively participating in gas exchange. So prone position would increase the was a thinking that would increase the perfusion to the baby lung in this ventral area. However, however, CT studies also show a development of increased density in this ventral areas once you put the patient in the prone position. But most of the alveoli actually are in the most dorsal areas. This is where you improve ventilation. So the loss of ventilation in the dependent area, then ventral areas and prone, is actually um, more than counterbalanced by the increase in ventilation in the now ventral areas and prone positioning. Then for years and years, it was controversial whether proning in ARDS actually makes a difference. Then in, 19, in 2013, Garin, um, Garin um, published a paper, the ProSeva uh, study, where they actually had a multi-center prospective randomized controlled trial that actually enrolled 466 patients that were proned. And proning not just for an hour or two, but proning for 16 hours 
or more a day compared to the patients who were placed in supine position. And they compared the 28 day mortality prone versus supine. So the mortality in the prone group was 16% versus 32% in the supine group. That's a um, redu relative reduction of 50% in the mortality. And the hazard ratio for adjusted for the sequential organ failure as, um, assessment was 0.42. So basically half the mortality, 40% of the mortality. Even looking out 90 days later, you find a decrease in the mortality in the patients who were placed prone, 24% versus more than 40% in the supine position with an adjusted hazard ratio of 0.5. This is this as a graph, the survival, the com cumulative um, probability of survival. There's a big difference. The prone position group had, right from the beginning, had an advantage in terms of survival. Again, with a relative um, reduction of death at, at um, 28 days of 50%. Then the next thing is, now we know proning for patients who are on a, have severe ARDS, moderate to severe ARDS, and severe ARDS works in patients who are on controlled mechanical ventilation. What's happening now if you have um, patients who are awake? Could prone positioning in awake patients help? Can it improve oxygenation? Can it avoid the need for invasive mechanical ventilation, especially when resources are scarce? Does it decrease the length of stay? Length of stay in the ICU? In the hospital? Both? And most importantly, does it decrease mortality? This is what it boils down to. So looking at studies, it started also with case reports. Um, Tullican in 1999 reported um, a case of a 16 year old who nearly drowned and was placed and was at severe, um, um, was severely hypoxemic. And this patient was actually awake and put prone and he improved actually dramatically this patient by prone positioning due to um, probably better VQ mismatching but also by better handling of the secretions that could easily be coughed up and then um, aspirated. Balta et, et, et um, colleagues in 2003 reported a case series of five patients of patients with pneumonia. Um, that's were only five patients but in these six patients in total, in these in this case report and this case series, they were they were um, able to avoid intubation. So this seemed to be a promising concept. But again, case series or case report. So that alone doesn't lead us to think about does proning really help. So the next step is. Um, there was a retrospective study by Scaravilli in, critical, in the Journal of Critical Care about five years ago it was an observational study that enrolled 15 patients with acute respiratory failure, meaning that the PA, PAO2 divided by FiO2 ratio, the PF ratio was less than 300. And those patients were um, prone position with or without um, non-invasive ventilation for a median of about um, three hours, but the longest eight hours. This is dramatically different from what I from the Garin's, from the Proceva study, where the patient was um, prone for 16 hours or even longer. They, in those, uh, Scaravilli, in those um, case study with 15 patients, actually had a total of 43 prone um, procedures. They had blood gases available pre-proning, at the end of the proning maneuver, and post-proning. This is actually already a pretty okay um, design study. And what they found, there's a significant improvement in the PF ratio in the patients with and without non-invasive ventilation. But as you can see on the graphs on the right side, the PF ratio. But most of those patients actually, when they were um, placed supine, this effect was not persistent. It was well tolerated, except for, in two, um, for two procedures that were aborted for um, patient discomfort. And Although they found an increase in oxygenation, which was, did, which was not persistent in the post proning phase, they didn't find any change in the respiratory rate in the pH or in the, C, in the PACO2. They didn't find a change in hemodynamics, neither improvement nor deterioration. And um, the caveat is not all patients uh, main, were maintained on the same mode of oxygen delivery. So what happened at times that patients who were on face masks were put on um, uh, mask CPAP while being prone. 
only 18 of those prone procedures were done with the same um, oxygenation or ventilatory support. Then there's awake proning um, for ARDF again with and without support by Ding in critical care um, 2020. So from this year, it's fairly new. It's also a prospective observational study with ARDS patients with a PF ratio of less than 200. So that means at least moderate um, ARDS. Um, those patients were mostly at this PF ratio measured on a PEEP of five with non-invasive ventilation on an FiO2 of 50%. Patients that were tolerating high flow nasal cannula, HFNC, with an FiO2 of less than um, 60% and um, an SpO2 of greater than 95 or equal 95, um, if they did not tolerate, um, they, were, they were prone. If they did not tolerate prone positioning with um, high flow nasal cannula, actually they, the mode of oxygen delivery was changed from HFNC to NIV, but still in prone position. The primary outcome in this study was, can we avoid intubation? Secondary outcome is the improvement in the PF ratio. So 20 patients were included and mainly for viral pneumonia, about 45% um, of them had H1N1. The average duration of prone positioning is rather short. It's again, a two hour prone position. Um, the primary outcome is that 55% avoided intubation, still leading to nine, per, nine patients intubated of which three eventually ended up being on ECMO. So this is actually severe air. They progressed to severe ARDS with complete oxygenation failure. The secondary outcome is that the addition of prone positioning to HF and C and non-invasive ventilation actually did increase the PF ratio. There's only two patients that had a lower PF ratio when they were prone. So the conclusion of this study is that the early application of, um, non of prone positioning uh, with non-invasive ventilation or HF and C high flow nasal cannula may avoid mechanical ventilation. Again, this is very carefully phrased because there's only 20 patients and of 20 patients Actually, 11 were not intubated. But they also concluded that patients with severe ARDS with a PF ratio of less than 100 with NI, on N, NIV, non-invasive ventilation, are not appropriate candidates for high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive non ventilation while being prone. That's a general concept is, is non-invasive non ventilation for severe ARDS uh, confer and a benefit. Um, Patients with a PF ratio of less than 100 are usually not, not considered good candidates for NIV in general. This is not altered, or this is actually kind of confirmed by the study by Ding, even if you combine this with prone positioning. This, is, this was all talking about patients with ARDS for other reasons than COVID. But what about our COVID patients? Are there any studies? COVID has, been, has not been there for long, so people really are looking into this. So there's actually two distant patient groups that you can see. One is those patients with, they are really distressed with moderate to severe hypoxemia. They are quickly deteriorating and they need, they require intubation. You have no time for non-invasive ventilation or trying to put them prone. prone. But there's another group of patients. They have an SPO2, but they don't seem to be in significant distress. I've seen patients within, um, on eight years of oxygen with a saturation in, in the low 90s, they didn't seem to be much bothered by this and speaking in full sentences. They are tachypnic, yes. They have chest x-ray findings that are similar to ARDS. We call them, or they're sometimes called as happy hypoxemics. They still seem to be doing okay. When we started, when we saw our first COVID patients, if somebody was escalating on the oxygen requirement to two, four, then six liters, we just intubated them. This was an extrapolation of um, experience that our Italian colleagues had made. They had, if anybody was, had increasing oxygen requirements, they just intubated. And they had a high mortality at that point, but it was thought to be beneficial and still save, save the patient's life. We wanted to intubate those patients in a controlled scenario, not crashing patients. If you have intubated crashing patients, it's an aerosol generating procedure, an AGP, that may actually put your staff at risk for also um, being exposed to droplets and um, about being infected with COVID. But that puts you in a situation that you then have limited resources, ventilators, ICU beds, that's a problem. So as this is a new disease, there is now with a lot of patients, we're gaining experience, but right now there's a 
lack of a large scale randomized controlled study. Um, the assumption for most of the studies is actually that compared that in, in terms of prone versus supine in ventilated patients is that COVID, uh, COVID ARDS is not that much different from other forms of ARDS. Although there's, there's a paper by uh, Dr. Gattanoni that says that differentiates the, the H and the L type, but this is just an assumption that COVID ARDS is not that much different. So propositioning is recommended for moderate um, to severe and severe ARDS in ventilated patients. In non-intubated patients with COVID, spontaneous breathing, uh, we, are, we are relying on case reports and case series. And of course, the social media people, there's COVID groups on Facebook and people are calling their friends, whether they have experience or what are, what's their experience. So there's a study in the, in, the, in the Journal of the American Medical Association Internal Medicine section in, in 2020 from June that actually comes that's actually looking at prone positioning in awake non-intubated patients with COVID-19 and hypoxic, hypoxemic respiratory failure by um, Allison Thompson. So they had 29 patients uh, with COVID included and they were actually asked to lie on their stomach, basically to self-prone. Four patients actually um, had to re require immediate intubation. They refused to prone, which left then 25 patients that were prone for an hour or longer. And in all those patients, while they're being uh, lying on their tummy, on their belly. We call it tummy time, actually. It's um, jokingly at times. Um, the SpO2 improved. Um, still, one third of those patients um, that were responders still required intubation sometime down the road. And um, with an SpO2 of greater than 95. And there were um, five out of six patients with an SpO2 with an oxygen saturation less than five, 95 were intubated. So the total intubation rate is close to 50%. That is still not, you could still, still say that's not great. And uh, down the line, three of those intubated patients uh, died. Fortunately, none of the non-intubated group passed at the time of the publication in June. Um, then there's a study with four, 24 patients with COVID-19 um, by um, Xavier El Hara, where they used uh, prone positioning also non-intubated patients, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, almost like a case series and patients were received oxygen supplementation with either HFNC, face mask or a nasal cannula. Um, two thirds of those patients tolerated prone positioning for more than three hours. And, but only 40%, um, meaning six patients responded with an increase of the um, PaO2 in more than 20%. Only 3%, uh, three patients of those 24 were persistent responders after resupination but there's unfortunately no information on um, the intubation rate. Then there's a bigger study that was done in the emergency room in New York City where, um, where Caputo asked and coworkers asked patients to basically self-prone instead of intubating. So they actually included 50 hypoxemic patients that arrived in the ED. Those patients had confirmed COVID and they arrived with the oxygen delivered through either through a nasal cannula or a face mask. So the median SpO2 uh, oxygen saturation was about 80% on room air and 84% um, with supplemental oxygen. So that's not a big difference. Um, but the median oxygenation increased to 94% while being prone without an adjustment in the oxygen flow. So no change in oxygen delivery method or in the amount of oxygen that was delivered. That's a dramatic um, improvement just by being prone. About one quarter of those patients required intubation within 24 hours. An additional five patients were um, intubated um, later than 24 hours after enrollment. Is there a sustained effect, effect of prone positioning? Unfortunately, not reported in the study. But it's at least the beginning, it's 50 patients. So looking at those two larger studies, if we just look at them from Allison Thompson and Dr. Caputo, so there's a 50% intubation rate in the Thompson study with the 25 patients who tolerate prone positioning. And there's a 36% intubation rate um, in the Caputo study that eventually, um, so 36% required intubation. None of those studies reported any mortality. So right now, at this point, those studies cannot answer the question, does prone positioning in an awake spontaneously breathing patient decrease the mortality? So we need a bigger boat, meaning, we need bigger studies. 
So then we looked at resp so Chiara's uh, Sartini looked at respiratory parameters in patients with COVID-19 after non-invasive ventilation and prone positioning. So we're stepping up the game. We're going from nasal cannula, face mask to adding non-invasive ventilation, the bigger boat on those patients who are prone. So 15 patients on CPAP were um, placed prone. And the SPO2 improved in all patients in the prone positioning. Actually, 12 patients had, which is um, 80% have sustained improvement after resupination. Two patients unchanged, one actually worsened. And one patient eventually was intubated. Um, my suspicion is it's the one that was worse after resupination. And one patient passed away. That's a very low uh, mortality rate. This actually shows this was done outside the ICU. This was in a res uh, resource constrained environment in Italy where at some point they were running out of ICU beds. And this shows that actually non-invasive ventilation is feasible outside the ICU. Um, but this study cannot answer whether any intubations were avoided in those um, patient population. There's a bigger study with 56 COVID confirmed patients. That is um, a prospective cohort study done by um, Anna Coppo, where they look at the phys feasibility and the physiologic effects of prone positioning in non-intubated patients. So the baseline PF ratio was 180 uh, millimeters mercury, so that qualifies for at least moderate ARDS. And 80% of those patients were actually on helmet CPAP, and one fifth of the patients were on face mask. So the majority of those patients, 46, tolerated prone positioning well. 50% of those patients actually responded to prone positioning with an increase in PF in the PF ratio after completion of the, P, uh, of the prone positioning maneuver. And about one third, 28% of those patients were eventually intubated. And this is a study, this is the a picture from that study where you see on the left hand side a patient prone with a helmet and propped up with a pillow. Um, and you see that there's the non -re that the responders had an increase in the um, oxygen in the PF ratio with proning and had a slight decrease. Some had an increase in resuffination, whereas the non-responders actually, most of them actually responded with an increase in the PF ratio, but had a significant decrease after being placed supine again. Um, the predictors of who's a responder to prone position or not is actually the patients with a lower platelet count actually respond better. Patients with a higher CRP were more likely to be successful, higher LDH. This is basically a sign that patients who had a higher, probably higher inflammatory response associated with COVID were actually um, more responsive. But there's a confounding factor that patients who were responders were actually prone earlier than the non-responders by, by a few hours. Um, Prone positioning did not substantially improve long-term oxygenation, but still you saw that the PF ratio was in those patients improved after resupination. The downside of this, if you have an improvement with prone positioning and it's sustained for a few hours after um, resupination, but the patient starts to deteriorate, this may actually delay. Um, it still may delay the uh, delay that you recognize that the patient is intubated, but it, it helps you in a way that some patients may avo avoid intubation and the delay of, of intubation that you can achieve with this may be the time that you need to free up an ICU bed or to free up a ventilator. And the biggest study so far is actually coming from um, Ferrando, where awake prone positioning actually showed that it does not reduce the risk of COVID-19 um, treated with high flow nasal cannula. It's actually a multi-center adjusted cohort study. They included almost 200 patients that received HFNC, high flow nasal cannula, of which 55, 28% were placed prone. The baseline PF ratio is actually already bordering from moderate to severe RDS with 111 and 125 in the um, supine and the prone group respectively. Um, 82 patients requiring intubation and there was no difference in the um, in the supine HFNC group and the prone HFNC group. The intubation rate was about 40% in, in both groups. There's also no difference in the um, intubation rate in the subgroup with severe ARDS with a PF ratio of less than 100 millimeter of mercury. Comparing the prone and the supine group, there's actually no difference in the length of stay in the ICU. Both, both patients groups stay about eight days in the ICU. There was no difference in mortality, but you also see there's a wide confidence inter interval from 0.56 to 10. 
that actually means that the study sample is probably much too small to answer that question, which is not surprising. Mortality studies usually need thousands of patients. And then there is, then there is patients requiring intubation that um, tend, that required intubation tend to be intubated two um, days later than uh, in the prone group. It is actually unclear um, in this, they didn't describe whether prone positioning was used per usual practice or as a rescue strategy. So intubation rate, high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation in the prone group, it's 28% in the copper study and 40% in the Ferrando study. And there's no difference reported in the, big, in the biggest study we have so far in this pine group, 14% versus 60% in the prone group. So to sum this up, prone positioning is well tolerated in most patients that are awake and spontaneously breathing. Prone positioning per se leads to an improvement in the PF ratio, but this effect may not be sustained even when the, when the patient is um, placed supine again. Tachypnea, PaCO2, um, feeling of respiratory distress is actually largely unchanged. Prone positioning um, may avoid or delay the need for intubation, but still one third to one to half of the patients that are place prone still need intubation. But it's important to identify the non-responsors so that you um, avoid delay in the necessary intubation. And the study, especially the Ferrando study with, uh, showed, not the study by Ding showed that a wake prone position is not suitable for the most severe uh, forms of COVID ARDS. That's compared to what we see in patients who are receiving non-invasive ventilation for ARDS in general. So what does the future hold? We need more randomized controlled multi-center studies with much larger numbers to answer questions like mortality or can we really safely avoid intubation? The studies need to answer, can we avoid this intubation? Does it also change the ICU and the hospital length of stay? And as I mentioned, does it decrease the mortality? Thank you very much for your attention and I'll try to answer the questions that I can see here. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Barman, for that insightful and uh, very interesting talk. Uh, we will now open to the floor for questions. Um, so viewers, feel free to leave your questions and comments in the Q&A section. So you have to just hover your um, mouse over the Q&A tab and you'll be able to type your questions and we'll try our best to answer, uh, Dr. Dirk will try and his best to answer any of your questions. Um, are there any potential questions? Um, if there are no other potential questions, I'm going to just take the uh, moderator's uh, prerogative to ask the first question. Um, so Dr. Dirk, uh, I'm just very interested in the strategies and the way proning is done. So how long do we actually prone these patients for throughout the day? And uh, what is the duration of therapy? And for those who are unable to tolerate the long sessions of proning, uh, would actually short sessions of proning help? So I think um, ideally you want to have those patients from uh, prone for for much more than for more than two hours in one session. Um, we had patients who are very anxious, um, being actually who liked being prone. They loved it and they stayed like for, for like almost like days in the prone position. What you can also do if those patients don't. Um, it's recommended to do this for at least 30, preferably two hours, and also to change the position. You can do a left lateral position, left lateral decubitus, or right lateral decubitus position, and ultra, and have the patient, for example, um, sitting up in bed while being supine, just not being flat supine. There are actually protocols um, out there. It's actually, um, it's promoted, there's, there's a good protocol by the um, British Society of Intensive Care Medicine that is available. All right, that's great. Um, so Rajesh has a question. Uh, so he states, he states that the difficulty he faced with awake proning is the duration and cooperation from the patient. So how do you actually overcome that? And what is the maximum duration you recommend? The, the, pro the problem is if the patient, it's, it's really a part of um, motivating this patient, getting the patient to tolerate this. Um, the, the studies, one of those studies that I mentioned, actually the one with the helmet CPAP, I do think they used um, low-dose sedation. I think they used 
I'm not 100% sure, but I do believe they use low dose morphine for this. It's kind of, con con um, I'm not sure if I would want to use a respiratory depressant, but there's other medication that has little respiratory um, depression and has also been, been able to, um, to take care of some of, of, of the agitation that you see. Oh, that's very interesting, the use of morphine for awake proning. Uh, yeah, that was that was that was kind of that was kind of interesting to use this. I, I guess if you use it at a very low dose intermittent bolus, this you could you could achieve you could achieve a goal. But yeah. I can tell you that in our ICUs it would probably not fly. Oh, it would I probably see. be limited to something that doesn't cause respiratory depressions. If you have an, a patient, you could try adjuncts as IV olanzapine that's available. I see. for example. So pharmacological uh, techniques. All right. Yeah, um, and also yeah. almost under under the chest, pillows mm -hmm. for the head, between mm -hmm. the legs. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us today, Dr. Dirk. Uh, so in the interest of time, we will actually move on to the next speaker. Uh, next up, join me in welcoming in our second guest today, uh, Assistant Professor Ramanathan. So uh, Dr. Ramanathan is an adult cardiac intensivist at the Cardiothoracic Intensive Care Unit at the National University of Hospital in Singapore, as well as the Program Director for the ICU Fellowship Program at National University Hospital. He received his specialty training in cardiac anesthesiology in India and was trained in intensive care medicine in Brisbane in Australia. He also completed his master's in clinical ultrasound from the University of Melbourne and has been awarded honorary fellowship by the American College of Chest Physicians for his contributions to critical care. Dr. Ramanathan has expertise in the management of patients on mechanical cardiac support in the ICU and his research interests include post-operative care as well as extracorporeal support. He'll be speaking on ECMO for severe COVID-19 disease. Um, over to you, Prof. Ram. Um, May Feng, I think uh, Dirk will have to um, uh, stop sharing his screen if I have to get my slides on. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Ramanathan, uh, just to let you know, uh, the presentation would take about 30 minutes and then we'll move on to the Q&A session. So yeah. to the audience, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave your questions on the Q&A chat. All right, over to you, Prof. Thanks, thanks, May Fang, for that uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you from, uh, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, I'm going to talk on uh, one of the um, important uh, modalities that has been used uh, quite often in this pandemic. In fact, uh, uh, we've seen uh, an exponential rise in the use of uh, this particular modality for severe COVID-19, the extracorporeal membrane obstination. Now, you've got to understand that um, as much as we know about this disease uh, as of now, um, the disease behaves more or less like how any other pneumonia would progressing to arts. Um, so, and the good thing about the disease so far has been that the fact that the majority of the patients have been asymptomatic. Um, a few of them definitely need hospital admission. And it's these kind of patients that get uh, some kind of oxygen therapy. Um, some of them go on to get uh, things like awake proning, which Dirk uh, alluded to earlier, and you'll be listening to uh, those who get steroids in the next, when the next speaker talks. Um, again, from those who get hospital admission, uh, a, a small number of these patients, a percentage of these patients definitely go on to get ICU admission uh, with severe pneumonia. And it's this group of patients who essentially get either ventilated um, and eventually prone. Uh, and when they still end up in refractory hypoxemia, despite all these measures, they get referred for ECMO. So one thing to uh, uh, put the uh, perspective straight um, at the start of the talk, the percentage of patients who go on to become refractorily hypoxemic and to get extracorporeal circuit is going to be a very small number of patients. 
Now, if you look at the pattern of disease uh, with COVID-19 per se, um, we clearly know, as, as I said, you know, uh, our, our knowledge about the disease is still limited, but at least from the pattern of disease so far, we can, we can clearly identify that it's not as, um, uh, or it's rather highly transmissible, and the clinical severity is anywhere between low to moderate. A very small percentage of these moderate, uh, moderate, those with moderate disease uh, progress on to severe ARDS. Uh, so the predominant uh, presentation uh, when they are severe um, is, is mostly respiratory failure or a respiratory failure with a mixed myocardial damage or heart failure. A very few percentage of these patients do get frank myocardial damage or heart failure per se as their presenting symptom. So the importance of ECMO in this context essentially comes um, when there is severe cardiopulmonary failure. Now, as much as the use of ECMO in uh, COVID-19 goes for respiratory failure, um, uh, even without COVID-19, we've had a few uh, randomized controlled trials that have been published. And ever since the publication of the EOLIA trial uh, in 2018, there has always been this debate as to where should ECMO fit into the treatment algorithm of ARDS. Now, the treatment algorithm of ARDS is more or less getting streamlined now, with ECMO clearly occupying uh, a finite space somewhere near that bottom area. So essentially, you know, uh, when, when things don't work and you have the right patient uh, who would fit uh, or who would satisfy certain criteria, essentially, you know, um, ECMO would be recommended. Uh, for those who are naive and uh, for those who do not know much about this technology, uh, in the simplest form or in the simplest way I can explain this is ECMO involves removal of uh, deoxygenated blood from uh, the large veins in the body and passing it through an artificial lung, which is called the oxygenator, and returning it back, returning the oxygenated and decarboxylated blood back to the uh, body. So essentially, you know, you're resting the native lungs when they are diseased till they recover and the artificial lung does the job for you. Now, well, it's easier said uh, uh, than uh, what happens in reality. Um, the question when COVID-19 hit um, or when the pandemic started was whether ECMO was really indicated. Now, um, there are two important facts that you need to consider uh, when you answer this question. The first thing was, what was the pattern of disease like? Now, this, is, this was a paper published way back uh, when the pandemic started. Uh, it combined uh, the patients from China, Italy, and South Korea to look at the demographic pattern of the disease. And what was interesting was disease clearly affected those who were elderly. Of course, we are now getting to see a lot of patients, a lot of kids, a lot of children being affected by COVID-19. However, if you look at the adult spectrum, it's mainly those who are elderly, and those who have comorbidities who are vulnerable to the severe form of the disease. So this is a typical group where you would not usually offer ECMO to. However, there is a group of patients who are, say, within the age of 40 to 70, who would still uh, have a good outcome if you offer them ECMO. Now, mind you, this is purely from a demographic profile that I'm talking. In a pandemic, it's not enough that you consider the demographic profile alone. Uh, you may have all the clinical indications to go on ECMO. What becomes more important is the ability of your system to cope. So if you, are, you have a good planning and if you have an ECMO service, which is um, quite uh, equipped uh, with, in terms of personal equipment facilities and systems, um, you are all good to go. Having said that, you know, um, if, you are, if, if, if you are a center that has not done ECMO before, the pandemic is probably not the right time to start doing ECMO. Um, again, as I said, you know, this takes into consideration a lot of planning for uh, a provision of ECMO services during the pandemic. So the, the, the question then comes, when exactly do you initiate ECMO in these patients? Now, as I said earlier, um, the uh, algorithm for ARDS is more or less uh, getting streamlined, uh, and we know where we offer venovenous ECMO for ARDS. Uh, 
Now, having said that, in the real clinical world, um, this is uh, what exactly happens in a COVID-19 patient. So they get the initial phase of viremia, followed by a, a phase of inflammatory response from the host. And essentially, uh, as and when they enter their pulmonary phase, they, they start having worsening PF ratios. And at a stage where their PF ratio is, say, you know, they move on to moderate to severe arts, they are, they are the right candidates for ECMO referral. And at that point, centers would need to start thinking about the need for ECMO in such a patient. So by the time they reach the hyperinflammation stage or what was what is uh, defined in literature as the cytokine release syndrome, when they reach the peak of that cytokine release syndrome, uh, you would find that they might have either gone on ECMO um, or they would be on the verge of going on ECMO. Now, uh, to streamline the uh, ECMO initiation, uh, the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization came up with a list of guidelines as to who would be the ideal candidate to go on ECMO. Now, uh, this is quite straightforward for those uh, who uh, follow ARTS closely. Um, now, this is clearly adapted from the YOLIA trial and the clinical criteria for starting of or, or initiation of ECMO clearly follows what Egoelia trial had to say. So in patients who have a low PF ratio defined as any of these or a fallen pH because of a rise of uh, carbon dioxide levels in blood, they are candidates for ECMO provided these satis they satisfy this criteria. Nothing much has changed uh, uh, with regards to management of COVID uh, arts as compared to other forms of arts when it comes to ECMO in this particular scenario. But what has been highlighted both by ELSO as well as by other papers that were published uh, during the time is the fact that ECMO should not be a therapy that should be rushed to the front line when you are clearly struggling for an ICU bed. Essentially, if the pandemic has hit you hard, the logistic reasons for starting or initiating ECMO should be considered and centers should clearly uh, stay away from offering ECMO if the capacity is overwhelmed. Now, uh, as much as the cannulation strategies for ECMO go, uh, the ELSO guidelines clearly see, say that you keep it simple. Don't try uh, heroics, essentially, you know, uh, a femoro-femoral or a femoro-jugular configuration for uh, um, running the ECMO would be the ideal strategy here. Now, having said now, we've, I've already told you uh, where exactly in the uh, course of ARDS would ECMO be indicated. Now, what's the available evidence for um, ECMO in uh, COVID arts or CARDS, as we say? Now, the initial outcomes for CARDS from, uh, came from China, essentially. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, these, these were, uh, uh, of course, they were not in big numbers, but what we saw was uh, when the, the um, uh, ECMO initiation happened probably at a time when the pandemic was at its peak. And definitely, you know, that was clearly um, visible in the outcomes they had. Most of the papers, or at least three of them, uh, uh, reported about 80 to 100% mortality, which raised a big question mark as to whether this particular coronavirus disease should be, um, uh, or patients with such disease should be subjected to ECMO at all. Now, further to that, we've had more evidences come out, the biggest of which was published last week or last month uh, uh, from the ELSO registry. And this essentially looked at thousand odd patients who needed ECMO and um, the uh, mortality, uh, the 90 day mortality as uh, seen from the registry or as recorded from the registry in the group of COVID-19 patients who received ECMO was about 37%. Quite similar to what you would see with community acquired pneumonia otherwise. So about one third of your patients die, the two thirds of your patients still survive. What was interesting about the patient pattern of these patients who received ECMO was the fact that um, the, uh, I mean, uh, the mortality risk was high uh, in the elderly. Uh, so did uh, the need for uh, venoarterial or circulatory support uh, did, the, uh, did increase the mortality. Uh, you also have to, I mean, the, 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 the paper also reported that the number of patients receiving tracheostomy uh, on ECMO also went up significantly. 
Now, if you were to look for other evidences available in literature or online, there are live dashboards uh, available from the ELSO registry, which reports on how many people are on ECMO as of now. Um, so if you look at uh, the number of COVID patients who have received ECMO so far and have been reported to the registry, there are about 3,000 patients who have already received it. And in the last 90 days, uh, about 2,000 odd who have received it with a hospital mortality of about 42%. So essentially, you know, the outcomes are somewhere between uh, uh, 35 to 40 percent mortality is what we are looking at. Again, you know, you get to see some of the classic uh, demographic patterns in these patients. Um, patients who received ECMO as reported to the registry were young. They had a higher BMI to note, and most of them were males. About 60 percent of them were prone, and 75 percent or three fourths of them received neuromuscular blockers. Um, now, if you if you turn your attention to what is happening in and around the Asia Pacific. So this was data which I could access from the dashboard way back in May 20. They have updated the dashboard thereafter, um, uh, but I cannot access the Asia-Pacific data. Uh, as of when the disease struck Asia-Pacific region um, and uh, these cases got reported to well, so um, the patients who received ECMO from this region were more elderly, so there were more in the 60 to 70 age group. Uh, their comorbidities were higher than the rest, uh, the number of people who needed ECMO in this region was small. And of course, uh, you know, um, the, the good thing which we noted was that the survival outcomes were better. Now, uh, uh, I have to add that the Japanese ECMONET uh, uh, group have uh, done an extensive job, a laudable job by uploading again a live dashboard where they have reported ECMO in about 260 odd patients. Um, their mortality is about 70 out of those 260. Um, so essentially about 25 to 30 percent of the patients have died. Surprisingly, you know, the ECMO uh, has been uh, um, initiated in patients above 50 years, most of them in the group, age group of 60 to 70, a few of them in the age group of 70 to 80 as well. Uh, this is a trend from Europe. Europe has the largest number of uh, cases uh, uh, reporting on the number of ECMO patients. They have more than 1,600 patients who have needed ECMO so far. 600 of them have died, so about 1,000 of them have survived ECMO so far. Um, uh, and these are the numbers. Again, you know, uh, their mean age is hardly around 50. Again, there is a male preponderance to those who received ECMO in Europe as well. Now, coming to uh, what ECMO, I mean, what COVID-19 or the pandemic has taught us on ECMO management. So we've learned a lot, just as we learned a lot about the disease, we clearly learned a lot about ECMO management, uh, the finer nuances of it as and when the COVID-19 progressed. The first and foremost thing, and any, this would be clear to anyone who has managed patients on ECMO during the pandemic, um, is the million dollar question as to whether how much uh, you would anticoagulate them. Uh, classic to, you know, um, I still remember uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet uh, where, you know, the, the question was to be or not to be. The same kind of question comes to your mind uh, whether to anticoagulate or to not to anticoagulate a patient. Uh, you got to understand that COVID-induced coagulopathy, coagulopathy is uh, probably unique. Um, it's different from uh, sepsis-induced coagulopathy as well as D DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. So the balance between thrombosis and bleeding is something which we still struggle to understand. And uh, depending upon which stage of the disease you are in, the depending upon how much cytokine release has happened and how this balance has tilted, you essentially decide on your anticoagulation requirements on a multimodal approach. If you were to ask me what is the ideal approach, I would say we still don't have an answer. However, you know, in the best, um, uh, I mean, for those who practice uh, otherwise, uh, institutions who have protocols for anticoagulation on ECMO, would tend to stop uh, heparin only if the patient is already in a severely coagulopathic state, more towards the bleeding side. Again, you know, no clear-cut guidelines on what the transmission requirements for uh, uh, COVID ECMO should be. But however, you know, based on the available evidence, um, uh, it's 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 recommended that you use higher hemoglobin tablet, uh, higher hemoglobin targets in hypoxemic patients. Uh, while you can you can maintain them at a relatively uh, 
lower level, uh, the critical care uh, thresholds uh, can be maintained in otherwise normal ECMO run. Again, routine care of ECMO hasn't changed much except for the fact that uh, you have uh, to add in the infection control component. Of course, probes used for ultrasound and radiology, it would be preferable if you have uh, specific probes that could be used for these uh, patients. Um, as I said, you know, uh, the other aspect which COVID-19 has taught us while managing ECMO patients is our ability to communicate better and clearly see that these people are using walkie-talkie though they are just across the door. Um, and of course, you know, we learned how to use signboards uh, to communicate major decisions while you were examining the patient. Uh, the major uh, question that came up during uh, the management of COVID-19 ECMO patients was the chance of um, the oxygenator of the ECMO, the artificial lung of the ECMO, uh, um, uh, getting um, or, or being a source of uh, COVID infection uh, because it does, it does generate aerosols. Um, however, you know, subsequent uh, small, smaller studies from institutions who have followed this up closely, mainly from Japan and France, they've clearly shown that unless and until there is a plasma leak within this oxygenator, the chances of you getting COVID-19 from the ECMO machine is, is almost negligible. Uh, we also learned that you can remotely monitor and control as well as manage your patient um, while you are doing ECMO. So essentially, as and when your patient stabilizes on ECMO, all these um, uh, uh, extensions come outside your negative pressure room and uh, your monitors, essentially, you know, uh, the nurses are able to monitor it from outside the room, uh, manage their infusions from outside the room. Essentially, you know, these have been innovative uh, things which the pandemic has definitely taught us. Um, again, transport of these patients requires a lot of uh, planning, as I said earlier, in our institution, we essentially make sure that the entire corridor is uh, kept clean uh, and uh, um, uh, the patients are transported at a time when uh, the um, uh, patient uh, traffic is very less or the bystanders traffic is very less. The other aspect, again, you know, COVID has forced us to be innovative uh, is about proning during ECMO. Of course, there have been a few papers which has been published in the past uh, in non-COVID patients. Now, uh, you got to understand that this is not to be done as a routine, nor should be done it done in centers that have just uh, embarked on ECMO. This is all done in uh, centers that are very much, very much experienced in proning. Uh, this is one of the first papers which got published earlier this year. Again, you know, uh, there was an improvement in uh, the PF ratios, the oxygenation parameters, of course, the mortality was quite higher in the prone group, very likely because you know these patients are more sick that you decide to prone them on ECMO. Uh, as much as I understand, there are more registry data coming out on proning during ECMO showing uh, interesting results. Uh, the, uh, the other innovation which uh, has happened during a COVID ECMO is the uh, 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 use of advanced or more advanced cannulas and now these are cannulas which can be put in through your jugular vein from your, uh, through your RA, RV into the PA. So essentially, you know, you connect the RA to the PA directly. And uh, uh, the group from Chicago essentially showed that um, their outcomes could be far better if you use such cannulas. Survival rates as high as 80, 70 to 80% um, with, with the use of such cannulas and they could even extubate patients. Uh, about 90% of their patients got extubated on ECMO with good survival outcomes. Uh, of course, drug pharmacokinetics on ECMO would uh, be different. We, we are slowly starting to get data on what could be the antiviral dosing modification that would be needed in COVID-19 patients who receive extracorporeal therapy, be it CRRT or be it ECMO. So drugs like Darunavir uh, would have high ECMO removal while things like, or, or you know, countries that would use drugs like favipiravir, uh, you might find that uh, the, the ECMO removal or the removal from the ECMO circuit per se is very minimal. Uh, definitely COVID-19 has put us in a spot when it comes to ethical considerations. A lot of questions still remain unanswered as to how you can guide ethical and clinical decision-making when patients don't improve despite ECMO. Who is the patient's proper advocate when you need withdrawal of support? How do you approach if priorities conflict between life and death? 
what happens uh, when you are clearly overwhelmed with your ECMO resources and you have a 20 year old knocking at your ICU with severe refractory hypoxemia. Again, you know, no straightforward answers to these questions, but these have been something, these have been things that have, that have clearly, you know, uh, kept us uh, uh, quite uh, worried uh, as ECMO physicians. Um, again, nothing goes without quality assurance and research. The most important bit is there is a lot of research going on in and around the use of ECMO in uh, COVID-19. Uh, the ECMO card is the biggest study that's still enrolling patients from or collecting prospective data on these patients, which is coordinated by the Asia Pacific ELSO and the Euro ELSO. And of course, I told you about the ELSO registry, which is collecting real-time data to track global ECMO activity. Now, uh, short, I'll conclude with uh, the Singapore perspective of uh, ECMO for COVID-19. Of course, you know, in Singapore, we clearly identified uh, when, we sat with, when we sat with the Ministry of Health as to how we are going to plan our ECMO services, we chose the hub and spoke model. Essentially, peripheral hospitals would refer to the two ECMO centers, uh, the NUH and the SDH, and both these centers would send satellite teams to NCID to support them. We clearly identified the key tenets, which includes planning, staff training, measures, and transport essentials. We did start our simulation on ECMO way back. We, you need to know that Singapore had uh, stockpiled quite a lot of PPE uh, equipments, including PAPR. So we needed to uh, uh, be clear as to how much uh, these devices affected um, your vision, your hearing, and all those stuff. Uh, uh, when you say embarked on something like ECMO initiation. So these were uh, drills uh, or simulations that were done sometime in January, February to familiarize with the instruments. Of course, everything was audited, reaction times were noted, standard operating procedures were then tweaked so that we could do this safely and swiftly. So the story as much as the uh, COVID-19 goes in Singapore, we've had about 58,000 patients in Singapore so far, 1,000 who were imported, 2,000 within the community. The bulk of the infection came from the dormitory workers, about 54,000 of them. The fact here is we worked clearly. Uh, I mean, the, the growing numbers didn't worry us in a big way because we were focused on making sure that we have to reduce the complications and death. So timely measures were taken in such a way that a lot of these patients were um, uh, uh, quarantined uh, at COVID community centers, only a few reached the hospital. The number of ICU admissions were hardly about 109, despite 58,000 patients, uh, of which you know uh, we had ECMO referrals for about 30 of them, and only six of them needed ECMO. 23 of them died in ICU. Uh, and a few of our critically ill patients who had ECMO, in fact, survived to go back to the community to tell their story to the rest of the world. So to summarize, uh, ECMO in uh, COVID-19 has grown exponentially. Uh, of course, care careful patient selection for ECMO is the key. A small number of highly selective patients will definitely benefit from ECMO. We need safe and good ECMO runs. It's not that you know we should be doing too much of ECMOs uh, to save everyone. Um, you got to understand that uh, the disease clearly interacts with our ECMO management. Uh, the need for ECMO is usually, uh, you would find that it coincides with the uh, uh, spike of cytokine release syndrome. Of course, there is still ongoing research to identify the ideal patient profile for ECMO initiation. And we hope to get answers from the research that's ongoing. Thank you, ready to take your questions. Over to you, Mayfang. Thank you very much, Prof Ram, for the very informative and excellent presentation. Um, so to the audience, if you would like to ask questions, please feel free to use the Q&A tab. Um, we are happy to take questions now. Okay, if there are no questions, I actually have a question. So, um, Prof Ram, uh, so there's a question about the anticoagulation. So, uh, in my center, we noticed that our COVID patients have a diverse range of uh, coagulopathies and the risk of uh, venous thromboembolism as well. So, I was just wondering how is anticoagulation managed and monitored in your center? And uh, what are the uh, anticoagulation targets? 
Yeah, uh, Mayfeng, uh, it's it's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, I may not be able to give you a straightforward answer to this. Um, at least from uh, our experience with the patients we have had so far, uh, most of them have needed stopping of heparin at some stage when they have gone into the bleeding side of the spectrum. Um, we have had bleeding complications from ECMO, uh, which have been quite fatal as well. So um, it's a tough question to answer, but as I said, you know, uh, uh, we have been very careful titrating anticoagulation in these patients. Uh, uh, our threshold for stopping ECMO has been uh, quite low, to be honest, uh, while we usually don't do that. Um, uh, the earliest signs of uh, seeing uh, bleeding uh, uh, diathesis with the patient, uh, we would be careful and any clinical evidence of bleeding, we do tend to stop heparin for say up to 24 to 48 hours. Um, having said that, we do make every um, arrangement to make sure that the bleeding diathesis is corrected ASAP. The one thing that happened during the pandemic is definitely, you know, the shortage of blood and blood products. So essentially, you know, this was a tough thing to tackle um, as much as we manage patients on ECMO. Mm, I see. Um, apart from like conventional coagulation tests like APTT, is there a role for, uh, for monitoring using like point of care testing like Rotem or thrombo electroplasty? Yeah, a good question, uh, Mei Feng. Um, to be honest, uh, the use, I mean, a lot of centers do use point of care testing. Um, it's not fully established yet. People still, if you look at uh, um, uh, quaternary centers that do ECMO and have institutional protocols, they are either based on uh, APTT or ACT. I mean, of course, ACT is a point of care test. Um, uh, uh, but with COVID, uh, increasingly, uh, we, as and when we got to saw a lot of patients with extremes of coagulopathy, few things we did try uh, looking at was factor 10A, measuring factor 10A levels. Uh -huh. and again, you know, as I said, no clear cut evidence as to which modality is good. Um, at the end of the day, you know, uh, you just have to manage the bleeding diathesis from the bedside as you normally do. Mm. I see. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us, Prof Ram. Um, yep. Uh, so we will just move on to the next speaker uh, in the interest of time. Uh, so our last and final speaker for this session needs no further introduction and is none other than Professor Gianfranco Maduri. Professor Maduri is a professor of medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. He first received his medical degree from the University of Padua in Italy and completed his pulmonary and critical care training at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the New York City. Professor Maduri first reported on the use of NIV in patients with acute respiratory failure in CHESS 1989 and was instrumental to the widespread standardization and implementation of this technique. At the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Prof. Maduri directed the Memphis Lung Research Program, conducting translational research focusing on the pathogenetic mechanisms involving in the activation and regulation of systemic and pulmonary inflammation during the natural progression of ARDS and re in response to prolonged low to moderate dose glucocorticoid treatment. Prof. Maduri conducted multiple trials investigating steroid treatment in ARDS and severe community-acquired pneumonia. Unfortunately, Prof. Maduri is unable to join us live at this time in light of the time difference, but uh, he has kindly agreed to pre-record his segment of the talk. We'll be broadcasting his pre-recorded presentation now, and for today, he will be presenting on glutocorticoid treatment of ARDS. Uh, with regards to questions, we will actually record down all your questions via the platform uh, through the Q&A tab, and then we will post up the answers on the EPIC 2020 website within two weeks of the conference. Um, without further ado, here's the presentation by Professor Maduri. A kind of invitation. The topic of my presentation is glucocorticoid treatment in ARDS. This is the only treatment shown to be effective in ARDS, and I will show you that it's safe and highly effective. I have no conflict of interest other than academic bias. 
Let me start with an introduction about acute respiratory distress syndrome that is very important, especially if your background is pulmonology. So recently randomized studies uh, provide robust evidence supporting the safety and efficacy of prolonged glucocorticoid treatment in ARDS. ARDS is an interstitial lung disease that involves all anatomical components of the respiratory lobule, not only the alveolar capillary membrane. This is extremely important. And the ARDS share histological, bronchoalveolar lavage, computer tomography, PET scan findings compatible with glucocorticoid responsive interstitial lung disease. Importantly, Interlistal lung disease are treated with metoprenisone for a duration of weeks to months. This is very important for our discussion. From the temporal uh, logic, and the RDS can be divided into temporal, three temporal phases. The first phase is the one of respiratory failure that goes from intubation to extubation, followed by a subacute phase of hospital recovery, and followed then by a long term. Uh, illness chron called chronic critical illness syndrome. So this is common in many patients with the RDS. What is important to recognize is that the duration of a mechanical ventilation is associated with an allostatic overload. What do I mean for that? That the process to restore health has a cumulative metabolic and bioenergetic cost that, that has consequences. And of course, consequences are both acute and long-term morbidity and mortality. So the first priorities of a treatment directed to the RDS is the one to decrease the duration of mechanical ventilation because it has impact not only acutely, but also long-term. And how do we achieve that? By directing our treatment at the core pathogenetic mechanism of ARDS that is improve the function of the glucocorticoid receptor that I will discuss. In the first part, I will show you the data and I will go to the result of 10 randomized studies, look at the treatment protocol used and the overall response, both in the form of effectiveness and safety. I have updated the meta-analysis done by the Society of Critical Care Medicine and Intensive Care Medicine published in 2017 adding the new randomized trial by Dr. Villar in Spain, published in February of this year in Lancet. So we have 10 randomized studies, four utilized methylprednisolone, five utilized hydrocortisone, and one, the Villar study, dexamethasone. We have a total of 1,100 patients approximately, 322 with methylprednisolone, almost 500 with hydrocortisone, and then in 277 of a study by Villar et al. What I'm gonna focus is this study. The four randomized studies involved here were part of the individual patient data meta-analysis. They provide important information regarding components of treatment, like timing of intervention, tapering, duration, et cetera. So I'm gonna focus on this a little bit. Now, those are the randomized trial. We're gonna talk about the drug use, number of patient drug use, what was the initial dosage that you realize later on is very important total duration of treatment and tapering after successful extubation. So in early RDS, we have eight randomized studies for early mean treatment starting within 72 hours of intubation. So in yellow are the metal prednisone study. So here we have one milligram per kilogram plus an additional milligram with the bolus. So we have a total of almost two milligram per kilogram over 24 hours. The duration is up to 28 days and then there is tapering. Those are the hydrocortisone study, they have a treatment of 40 to 60 milligram methylprednisolone equivalent a day for a total duration of seven days, that's it, and there is no tapering. Then we have the dexamethasone study that has about 100 mil equivalent a day uh, for five days, followed by half a dose for another five days, and there is no tapering. In late RDS, we have only methylprednisolone study, double the dose of early RDS, duration for four weeks and greater, and there is lack of tapering only in the RDS network study, which tapering was over 36 hours. That's it. Now, many people ask me what is my favorite compound. 
And actually, there is no difference between this compound. What is very important is uh, the way treatment is delivered. The initial dose is very important. The total duration of treatment is very important and tapering after successful extubation. So I'm going to focus on those three in my discussion. In summary, are differences in glucocorticoid protocol affecting outcome? The answer is yes. This is my favorite one highlighted in yellow. I prefer metoprilizol and dexamethasone to hydrocortisone. Timing of administration should be early. Technically, the best is within six hours of development of ARTS. The mode of administration should be bolus followed by an infusion instead of intermittent boluses. And the duration of treatment should be of up to 28, 32 days. Now I'm gonna show you the impact of reduction in systemic inflammation on improvement in gas exchange, accelerated disease resolution, reduction in duration of mechanical ventilation and duration of intensive care unit stay. We're gonna look at all 10 randomized studies. And this is the percentage of positive among those that reported this finding. And what you can see there is almost 100% across. Let's go into the detail. First, the metal prednisone study. There is a significantly positive response in all of these criteria. What about hydrocortisone? A lot of positive, there are some not reported, as you can see, and then two no, but those two no also have the reduction that did not achieve significance. And then we have a dexamethasone study that is positive for all, but not reported for systemic inflammation. So the message is the following. When you group all this study, no matter what compound or what treatment, duration, et cetera, et cetera, during intervention, there was a significant reduction in inflammation, improvement in gas exchange, mechanical ventilation as you lose SSD. So the results are consistent among randomized trials. This is extremely important, consistent findings. Now I'm gonna focus on the IPDMA of the four metoprenizone study. And first look at, does the treatment work? Was the treatment associated with biological improvement? And we're gonna look at what happened in the plasma, BAL, and arrow down is decreased, arrow up, this is a mistake, I apologize, is increased. So, first of all, we have a significant reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokine additional molecule, in C-reactive protein, in the plasma BAL and in the plasma. There is an improvement in markers of a capillary permeability in the broccoviola vage and from in production of collagen type 1 and 3 that is very important in the progress to fibrosis or fiber proliferation. There is a significant improvement in albumin. This is important. The levels stop the production, decrease the production of QFS reactant, so albumin production goes up. There is an increase in anti-inflammatory cytokines in ratio with pro-inflammatory cytokines. There is an increase in functional large aggregate of surfactant, very important. And believe it or not, in protein C, activated protein C actually has uh, an improvement that is very similar to the one on methylprenizolol, but methylprenizolol has significant lower cost and without complications. So is this biological response, okay, those are all significant changes associated with a clinical improvement. So now we're gonna look at what happened in those four randomized studies with aggregate data in the outcome by day 28. So we're gonna look at those that died before extubation, those that achieve extubation by day 28, on day 28 still alive, but still on mechanical ventilation, and those discharged alive from the ICU. Let's see what the results are. In yellow is methylprenizolone, in white is the control group. Extubation, 80 versus 50. Alive, but not extubated, significant difference. Discharge alive, 75 versus 50%. So what you see here is a sizable improvement that is highly significant for all these clinically important variables. So biological improvement was associated with physiological and clinical improvement. And what is important is this, is the reduction in duration of mechanical ventilation. So the message is that methylprenizolol, based on this analysis, is highly effective. And the cost is only $240 for one month of treatment in the United States, and most likely less in other countries. So inexpensive and highly effective. Now let's look to time to successful extubation to see if there is a difference between starting treatment early versus late. This is late RDS, after day seven, 
and the, the, this is the dosage used using boses, and this is the hazard ratio, risk ratio, hazard ratio. And the, what you see here is that there is a doubling of the extubation rate by day 28, and it's highly significant. This is when it starts late. So after 14 days, this is what we achieve. Now, let's see what happens if we start before day three, but there is a difference. Not only the dosage is lower, but we add an infusion in both of these studies. And now the rate of extubation is three and a half times. Look at this. Look at, at day 14. By day 14, in the two groups, both control have a similar rate of extubation. But the metoprenisolone, when start early, significantly increase the rate of extubation. So that by 14 days, 90% of the patients achieve extubation, 90% by day 14. So this is extremely important. Start early, that's the message. And when you do that, you triple, more than triple, the rate of extubation in comparison to control. So effective in improving biology, in practice, in decreasing duration of mechanical ventilation, best when it works early. Now, I wanna give you this message over and over again because it's extremely important. Tapering is a must. So this is a study look at patients with severe pneumonia with ARDS, and what you see here is the metal prenisolone group, and this is without ARDS, this is the hydrocortisone group, both given as bolus as an infusion, and this is the placebo group. So both have a nice reduction in reactive protein, but the hydrocortisone group was discontinued after seven days while methylprenisolone was continued. And what you see here is an increased insulin-reactive protein. And what you see here is time to extubation was similar in the two groups, but then stopped for hydrocortisone, whilst other cortisone were discontinued, and instead continued with metoprenisone. So what happened? 13 patients at treatment discontinued, rebound. Seven of 13 had an increase in CRP. So this is the average of 13 patients, okay? But seven of them had a significant increase. Three of the seven have worsening organ dysfunction. Three of the seven return to mechanical ventilation. Two of the seven died after day 15. So this continued treatment without taping has an important impact, important impact. Now let's go back for a moment to the individual patient data meta-analysis. It allows to look at the impact of tapering because rapid tapering was used in the ARDS network study and slow tapering in the other three. So let's look. Methylprenisolone yellow, placebo white, and first we'll look at what happened in the ARDS network with slow, uh, with the rapid tapering or no tapering. 26% of patients return to mechanical ventilation after you stop steroids, 26 versus 7%. In the slow tapering, the other three randomized study combined, there was no difference in returning to mechanical ventilation. But I want to point out that none of these patients here return to mechanical ventilation for recrudescence of ARDS. All patients here return to mechanical ventilation for recrudescence of ARDS. So what happened when we stopped steroids rapidly? And the, of course, this was highly significant. What happened when we re, re, uh, removed steroids rapidly? Okay, and we look here at the timing between extubation to return to mechanical ventilation. It's five days, okay, five days. And what happened? Treatment was discontinued within two days of extubation. Three days later, the average of patient three days later return on mechanical ventilation. So what happened? There is rapid rebound. This is not a delayed process. It's very rapid. And this is associated immediately with the impact of the patient with rapid deterioration required return to mechanical ventilation. Instead, in a placebo group, those that return to mechanical ventilation, it was not related to rebound inflammation and return to mechanical ventilation much later on for a host of other reasons. So it's very important that you taper it. Tapering is essential. Now, let's look back at reduction duration of mechanical ventilation. We're going to look at the dexamethasone and methylprenisolone study. This is the duration of mechanical ventilation in the treated patient versus placebo. And what you see there is doubling rate of uh, a doubling of the reduction in duration of mechanical ventilation in the methylprenisolone group. And so let's look at the individual data of these four randomized studies to see if there is any consistency. And what we see here is the three randomized study, two randomized study in early RDS, two in late RDS. 
First, we look at the duration of mechanical ventilation in the methylpian isolon, then in the placebo group. And of course, it's much higher in those with late ARDS. And the difference consistently between nine days to 10 days. So consistent results among four randomized trials, very unusual for clinical care medicine. So consistent large reduction duration of mechanical ventilation. Now look a moment at this one. This is the RTS network study. The reduction of mechanical ventilation was 9.5 days. It was only briefly mentioned in the result section here. Patient given metoprenism were able to breathe without assistance sooner. And this is it. Never mentioned again. Okay. And what they forgot to include in their uh, manuscript is that those that survived at the reduction duration of mechanical ventilation of 12 days. This is a very important clinical information that was, I believe, partly repressed. I strongly recommend an educational journal club, in which you compare the review of a 2006 New England Journal publication versus the one of critical care medicine that is a reanalysis of the data. So we have the same data set, yet to contrast in the interpretation. This one says that treatment is ineffective and safe. This one concluded, same data set, highly effective and safe. So this is a very important educational uh, journal club, I believe. Now, so let's look at mechanical ventilation three days very briefly. 8.5 days difference, four days and five days with metoprenizolone, hydrocortisone, and dexamethasone. I'm going to use this form of forest plots all throughout. Now let's move into hospital mortality, which I think is more important than 28 day mortality or anything else. This is important. So let's look first at what difference in mortality in the early RDS. This is the dexamethasone group, 34%, 35% uh, relative reduction in mortality. 24, 23% with hydrocortisone and 54% with metoprenizole. In late RDS, the difference in mortality is 46% with metoprenizole, okay? Now let's look at the forest plot of this meta-analysis of patients randomized before day 14. And what you see, 50% relative reduction in mortality with metoprenizole. Uh, 25% with hydrocortisone and 35% roughly with uh, dexamethasone. 60, 0.65 uh, risk, risk ratio for the overall group. Now the number needed to treat to save one life is five for metoprenizolone, 10 for hydrocortisone, eight for dexamethasone, seven overall. Okay, very free. This is the most effective treatment so far documented in ERDS. And I want to point out one thing, that although we saw a reduction in mortality in the low tidal volume study by the ERDS network, there was no reduction in duration of mechanical ventilation. We saw 10 days mean median above uh, in both groups. So that's a very important thing to pay attention to. What about complication or safety? Well, in comparison to placebo, there is a similar risk of neuromuscular weakness, GI bleeding and infections. And when you give a bolus, we'll discuss that, there is hyperglycemia associated with that, but there's no negative as without negative impact on uh, outcome. Now, this is the things that are very important. In the literature, there is frequent misrepresentation of risk for complication. And how do you do that? You do it by quoting old randomized study using massive doses of steroids over 24 hours or study from the rheumatology literature, okay? Which of course, when you use steroids for a long period of time, there are no complications that every physician know. And this misinterpretation is used to rationalize short duration of glucocorticoid exposure in randomized study, which is really absurd. And instead what is underappreciated is the risk of rebound inflammation and ARDS relapse when you have rapid discontinuation of treatment. So what happened in your study or randomized included, this treatment for only seven days, the avoid tapering, okay? So they really shortchange the potential benefit from a different treatment mode, mode that we discuss. Now regarding infection, patient with new infection, what you see here that in the metoprenizone, the one they use the longer duration of treatment, three to four or five weeks, okay, had actually a trend to a reduction 
in developing a patient with new infection, and there was no increase in hydrocortisone or dexamethasone. So very, very important. So if anybody tells you that there is increased risk of infection with steroid, that is not true, based on results of randomized trials. And actually, there is evidence that uh, using uh, decreasing uh, the degree of life-threatening systemic inflammation may be associated with a lower risk of development of the colon infection, because you decrease the duration of mechanical ventilation, obviously, but also because reduction in inflammation is associated with a, an environment that is less favorable to intra and extracellular bacterial growth. And these studies were done on Pseudomonas, Sassinetobacter, and Staphylococcus aureus. There is increased improve, uh, improvement in ability of a neutral field to opsonize and phagocytize bacteria. And there is intracellular killing. So all these data are available indicating that the reduction in systemic inflammation has improved the ability to fight infection. Now, the next part is how to do, how does it work? This is very long. I have to decrease it to a couple of slides, so I apologize for that. I refer you to this if you want to have some more information because in all this manuscript that was just published, because there has been a significant advancement in the last 10 years that brings the use of steroids to a completely new light. Now, how do steroids work? So steroids are agonist compounds that bind to the ligand binding domain of a glucocorticoid receptor, mainly alpha, to produce a biological, or what we give it, pharmacological response, very important. Now, they have the most important homostatic hormone. They regulate more than 20% of the human genome. And the steroids have important rapid non-genomic effects that unfortunately I cannot cover uh, during this presentation. So what is the role? Why do we give steroids? It's not just anti-inflammatory, this is important. It to support the central regulatory function of the activated glucocorticoid receptor throughout all phases of disease development of the solution. So now there is abundant literature at least that some form of low-dose steroids is essential to accelerate disease uh, uh, resolution after the patient has passed the acute phase of respiratory failure. So this is all new and it's very important. I strongly encourage you to read this article that provides a new perspective in crit of critical illness. So the glucocorticoid receptor alpha operates at four places, cytoplasmic, and the nuclear DNA that I will show you next. And then the important cell membrane, this is for non-genomic, rapid non-genomic response, and mitochondria, this is all new. So let me say in summary, the steroids increase the number of mitochondria and the functional mitochondria and they're essential to overcome oxidative stress. Now let's focus on this one very briefly just to give you some understanding how the glucocorticoids work. So this is the cell membrane, this is the nucleus. So this is the glucocorticoid receptor, uh, is present in almost every cell of the body. For instance, 5,000 neutrophils, 10,000 in the cytoplasm of macrophages. And this nuclear factor kappa B, the most important transcription factor for pro-inflammatory cytokines and a lot of other things. And NF-kappa-B is present in the cytoplasm bound to an inhibitory protein called I-kappa-B. When a host of inflammatory signals reach the cell membrane surface, kinases are formed that phosphorylate and degrade I-kappa-B. And now the NF-kappa-B, that is a transcription factor, is free to migrate to the nucleus, bind to the response element, in start the transcription of pro-inflammatory cytokines, et cetera, et cetera. The list actually is quite huge, includes chemokines, inflammatory enzyme, adhesion molecule receptor. There are hundreds, if not thousands of mediators that are transcribed by NF-kappa-B. And I encourage you to use this new article. The little is very important, especially for COVID-19, the showing the, the relationship between NF-kappa-B, inflammation, and thrombosis that they occur both in critical illness and also in patients with severe COVID-19. Now, when inflammatory cytokines are released in the systemic circulation, they give rise to systemic inflammation. 
systemic inflammation activate the hypothalamic pituitary axis. There is production of cortisol, or in this case, or exogenous, we, we give exogenous glucocorticoids, either one, the lipophilic, freely cross the cell membrane, bind to the glucocorticoid receptor that now is activated. Once it's activated, as a transcription factor, migrate to the nucleus, bind to the response element, and start the production of anti-inflammatory mediators. But most importantly, it's a more rapid action in which the activated glucocorticoid receptor bind to the activated F-kappa B, blocking F-kappa B from going to the nucleus that transcription of inflammatory mediators. Now, we have done study that uh, uh, you can look, uh, you can see this manuscript here showing that when we give metal prednisolone, we increase the number of glucocorticoid receptor number. We increase the number uh, of uh, glucocorticoid receptor binding to F-kappa B. We decrease significantly NF-kappa B binding to the DNA. It's increased significantly the binding of glucocorticoid receptor uh, alpha to the glucocorticoid response element with an increase in IL-10 and I-kappa B and with a significant reduction because we block NF-kappa B in the transcription of this inflammatory mediator. So it's very, very important. So when we give glucocorticoids, we potentiate the action of the glucocorticoid receptor alpha. Now let's jump to pharmacology. So this is, there are several components and I wanna just show you some basic element that determine the clinical efficacy of glucocorticoid treatment. Basic uh, pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, dose response, concentration time profile, and lung penetration concentration. And then a second part of pharmacokinetics that's extremely important to clinician because it shows the between patient variability in blood levels, despite receiving a similar protocol. So the determinant of clinical efficacy is drug potency plus exposure at the receptor site. So this is where we start. So what gives you a more response? The number of glucocorticoid receptors. So there are studies clearly showing that uh, patients that have uh, severe RDS have a significant reduction in glucocorticoid receptors. Okay, and then we give glucocorticoids, this amount as is increased. So number of receptors is very important. Second, binding of a specific glucocorticoid molecule affinity to the glucocorticoid receptor. And this correlates with potency, it will go there. So if you have a drug with lower potency, for instance, hydrocortisone instead of dexamethasone, you can offset this issue by increasing the dose or giving more frequent doses so that you achieve higher target site concentration. Now, regarding how to give a drug, the magnitude, so dose and tissue penetration is important and duration of exposures. We'll go over this. So this is the basic element that determine how treatment can impact clinical efficacy. So as I told you, Receptor is increased with steroids, potency is related to affinity, and exposure is related to dose and duration. Now, the in vitro response to glucocorticoid is proportional to the in vitro binding affinity that is expressed as log as relative receptor affinity. And what you see here is that dexamethasone is the drug associated with a higher binding affinity. That's why it's the most potent. Uh, drug for genomic response, followed by metoprenisone and hydrocortisone. Now, when we look at in, in vivo potency, it's expressed as IC50. So this is the plasma concentration to achieve 50% of the maximum response. And what this study shows is that the relationship between potency and affinity is linear, okay? So highly correlates. So again, let's go back to this. Binding affinity, okay, define the potency of a drug. Dexamethasone, metoprednisone, hydrocortisone. Now, next, how we use the drug. So the magnitude and duration of exposure at the glucocorticoid receptor site is important. And this is defined in this way. So area under effective time, effective time curve, AUC, okay, until it drops below a minimal, minimum effective concentration. So during this, in this, in the, here, under this curve, the drug is effective. When you go below that, there is no effect. 
So now let's discuss about those. What I'm gonna show you now is the way rheumatologists that have studied glucocorticoids more than anybody else, look at the therapeutic effect based on dosage. This is methylprednisone equipment. We go from low dose to moderate doses, okay? And let's see what happened. First, we're gonna look at the genomic effect, the one that I show you in the slides, okay? So decrease re uh, reduction in inflammatory cytokines, increase in anti-inflammatory, et cetera, et cetera. Then we're gonna look at the non-genomic effects that are extremely important. And then, and then there is a continued expansion of the knowledge here. And then we look at the combined effect. So if we give 80 milligram metoprenisone, we're here. So with those here, what you achieve is almost all genomic effects and some part of a non-genomic one. When you go to 160 instead, you, achieve, you are very close to the maximum effect that is achieved at 250 uh, plus minus milligram of metoprenisone. Now let's take to the reality of uh, RDS. Remember, magnitude plus duration of exposure at the receptor site is what determines the effectiveness. And now we're going to do a concentration time profile. First, methylprednisone, then hydrocortisone, then dexamethasone. So those are, that's what we're going to look. What happens if I give 80 milligram as an infusion only? Or before the infusion, I give a bolus, or I give 20 milligrams to six hours. That's what we see in randomized trials. So if I give only an infusion, it takes a while to achieve a therapeutic effect. Okay, so there is a delay in the first 12 hours. If I give a bolus, if I give instead intermittent doses, I go up and down, up and down. That's not exactly what we like to see. We like to see more of a sustained effect. When I give a bolus, 80 milligram, followed by an infusion, that's what we recommend, you see a rapid increase, and then we see a constant phase here. So under the curve, this is the most effective one of among the four. Hydrocortisone, again, when you use 50 million Q6 hours, the most common one, up and down, up and down, with a lot below uh, the minimal effective uh, concentration. Then when we give 80, uh, uh, I'm sorry, when we give uh, 100 milligram Q, Q8 hours, very high, very good, and then we go down. So there is a lot of time in which it gets an effect and there is no effect. And this is when we give a bolus followed by an infusion, okay. What about dexamethasone? This is dexamethasone, 80 milligram, I'm sorry, 100 milligram equivalent, 20 milligram dexamethasone uh, a day as one single dose. This is when we add an infusion. They seem to maintain higher level for longer period of time. So what I'm trying to say from all this is that the infusion, I believe, is very important. Now, lung penetration. So this is open to debate, actually. But if you are a pulmonologist, you know that metoprenisone is the standard medication that we use for interstitial lung diseases. And there is a, there is a reason for that based on studies that were done 20, 25 years ago. So the lung, believe it or not, behaves as a distinct and separate body compartment in this case. And there, is, there are studies in which they give a single dose of a drug and they look at the difference between plasma and BAL and they found that hydrocortisone has the similar concentration, half with methylprenisone, one third with prenisone. Then there are studies that look at the longitudinal, that's what we're interested in, longitudinal. And they compare methylprenisone to prenisone and prenisone. And what we found is that methylprenisone increased penetration to the lung that is higher when you use an infusion. So when you use an infusion, there is more penetration to the lung. That's why I like the infusion. And there is lower clearance from the line, leading to increased accumulation over time, even when plasma level has decreased. So that's the reason I use methylprenisone in inflammatory lung diseases. And this is a study showing that as the plasma concentration goes up, there is very little change in prenisone. Prenisone instead is very high for methylprenisone. So, and since hypothesis is affected by duration of exposure, this can be taken into consideration. Now, what is important to notice is that this was done in patients without ARDS, so patients without alveolar capillary permeability, which may be completely different uh, finding in patients with ARDS. But this is the rationale 
that FOMO knowledge have used in the last 40 years to use better prednisolone in inflammatory Lyme disease. Now, now we go to the real thing. So these are true uh, study, uh, pharmacokinetic studies done in patients with the RDS. So this is early RDS, the methylprednisolone protocol was a bolus, one milligram per kilogram ideal body weight, followed by an infusion over 24 hours of the same dose. And this is what we see. In the first 24, 48, 72 hours, there is a reduction in clearance, clearance of what? Hepatic clearance. Hepatic clearance of the drug is slow initially. Why? Because systemic inflammation impairs hepatic clearance, but the drug metabolizing enzymes are to chrome P450. Okay, so it's very important. But as systemic inflammation drops with the use of corticosteroid, usually achieved, with, by, achieved within 72 hours, then hepatic clearance improves. So far, so good. Okay, so I have low clearance initially because of massive inflammation. As inflammation goes down, my clearance improves. But there is a problem. Look at patient 15 here. Patient 15 stay low. There is no change in hepatic clearance that is low all throughout. Look at patient 17 instead. There is a rapid improvement in plasma clearance that is way above for the one of the mean of all these patients. So what do we have? Despite the patient receive the same protocol, we have a completely different response regarding hepatic clearance. This is important, okay? Because hepatic clearance affect plasma levels. And plasma level is what impact response to treatment. Now, there is a lot of variability. Now let's look at the pharmacokinetic data directly in these patients. So this is what happened over time. And we have with the bolus of 80 milligram roughly a rapid increase followed by an infusion. Okay, so this is good for both non-genomic and genomic effects. Then there is improvement in hepatic clearance. Okay, so now I start to clear, the level goes down, I achieve a steady state. Okay, but look at the range during the steady state okay, in levels from 50 to 120. Look at this, there is a lot of variability, a lot of variability, okay? And this affects the magnitude of exposure. So it's more likely that these patients have a better response than these patients. Now all these studies need to be done. This is very important. And then we'll decide how this has clinical implication. So if I give this protocol to a patient and the patient doesn't respond, maybe it's because there is the patient belongs here and I don't achieve adequate level for one reason or the other. There are many we just touch on hepatic clearance. In fact, it improved most likely the patient is here. So how do I know if there is an effect or not? Well, I look at marker of inflammation and C-reactive protein is the cheapest one. So this is a very important concept. So similar to when you give uh, vasopressor to a patient, you monitor blood pressure. When you give glucocorticoids, you monitor CD-RT protein, whatever other mark of inflammation that you have. This is very, very important. Then you adjust accordingly. Like we adjust the oxygen uh, delivery or mechanical ventilation setting in order to improve uh, uh, gas exchange. So this is very important. So finally, let's go to the practical things. How do we use uh, the correct use to do this? So timing, dosage, mode of delivery, duration, tapering, and other co-intervention that I have time to cover here are elements that are essential to achieve optimal response to treatment. So this is how you do it. Start early. Technically, I believe that the best thing is within six hours and there are reasons for that that you refer to the manuscript I show you in the middle. Then you follow with an initial bolus. Why do I need a bolus? Because I want to immediately saturate the glucocorticoid receptor to achieve a thera immediate therapeutic response. And this should be followed by an infusion. Why? To achieve high level of response, to increase lung penetration based on the study I showed you, and to decrease glycemic variability. And finally, you dose adjust. You see the variability? So adjust to reactive protein. If you see reactive protein or the patient gas exchange deteriorates, there are action to take. If there is an improvement, there are action to take. And should give them for a duration targeting clinical laboratory improvement, followed always by those tapering for gradual recovery of the hypothalamic P3 axis. Now, the guideline uh, from uh, the task force of the Society of Clinical Care Medicine and Intensive Care Medicine recommended the protocol that I'm going to show you next. 
So this is the report was recommended in 2017, I'm sorry. And here we go. So this is a protocol that we use at our institution uh, based on randomized trials and so forth. Uh, and uh, here we go. So this is diagnosis of ARDS. The patient is intubated, diagnosis is established. Start immediately, as soon as you can, with a bolus of metoprednisolone, 80 milligram. While you do that, achieve rapid saturation of glucocorticoid receptor. I want immediate effect. Then it should be followed by an infusion, we discuss why. So the same dose, but in 240 cc of saline at 10 cc an hour, beautiful infusion. And then you can add co-intervention. And the co-intervention that I recommend are vitamin C, B1, and D, it's very important for both glucocorticoid receptor and mitochondrial function. And what to achieve with this, you repress inflammation, very important. During mechanical ventilation, you monitor C-reactive protein daily, lung injury score, SOFA score, infection parameters, and procalcitonin. So what are the infection parameters? If a patient improves and now plateaus, I suspect infection because it can occur in the absence of fever. If there is an unexplained increase in mini ventilation or in the WBC bands, not WBC alone, I suspect an infection. And then you can look at our study how to operate. But proclacetone is important because it's not affected by glucocorticoids, but we do not have study looking at the role of proclacetone in identifying infection in patients with the RDS and gas steroids. Now, monitor response. So if a patient deteriorates or fails to improve, what most likely happens? This is a patient that despite all what we do is low levels of metoprenisolone in the circulation. So there is no adequate response. What do I do? I double the treatment. They go from one milligram per kilogram, roughly 80 milligram, to double 160 milligram. Surveillance BAL uh, used to be very important for us, less now, mainly because most patients get extubated in the first seven to 10 days, that's it. So we don't do as many BAL as we used to. And of course, it should be done only in patients that can tolerate a bronchial bivalvage. And the BAL is useful to identify infections in the absence of fever, but also to follow the neutrophil concentration that tells how much inflammation there is in the lung. Now, if a patient instead improves more rapidly, most likely at the higher level of metoprenisol in the circulation. So if you're six to extubated before day 14, you advance to day 15. So this is how you monitor. Fail to improve, go up, rapidly improve, go to the next level. And the next level is same infusion, half a dosage. Now, what we have learned is the following that is very important. After you extubate the patient, do not give by mouth metoprenism for five days because enteral absorption, okay, is poor for five days after sedation. We didn't find any metoprenism in the circulation of a patient when it was given PO. So continue IV for at least five days. Now, why do I want to use the lower dose for prolonged period? Because, and I didn't have time to show you, but I referenced to the literature, lower dose steroids are very important to resolve and restore anatomy and function of the lung. How long should I use it? Well, if a patient is still on oxygen, the lung has no repair. So I will continue steroids, at least until the patient is on oxygen, but manage that monitoring CRT protein level at the same time. And finally, always add six days, at least to eight days of tapering, tapering to restore the HP access. That's extremely important. So this is the protocol that we have recommended, but Dexamethasone is as good. So I'm not telling you which one to choose. That's your choice. Dexamethasone will be advantage of using also one every day. The result by the group of Pilar are excellent, okay? But I will add, and again, this is not in the protocol, my consideration to add some modification to that. Number one, I will, will not remove a treatment before extubation, okay? Instead, the treatment is time with extubation. And I will follow with the long tapering. The long tapering is necessary for in support the process of repair, repair and to restore HP access. So that's very important. So that will be my modification to this protocol. I think in both dexamethasone and metoprenisone are highly effective. So is the umbrella effective? So this is the use of umbrella in people that know how to use it. You definitely miss them. This is the use of the umbrella in an expert, in expert hands. This is the use of umbrella in people we love, in love. So don't blame the umbrella if you get wet. 
So the message is correct use of glucocorticoid treatment of LDS gives a positive effects, lower, no increased rate of complication, but has to be used correctly. And I hope this presentation will help in that direction. I will send a daily copy of our protocol to the organizing committee for distribution. Until next, thank you very much. It was a Okay, thank you once again, Professor Maduri, for that informative and very wonderful talk. Uh, for the audience, please feel free to send us your questions and comments using the Q&A tab, and these will be relayed to him, and we'll try to post up the answers on our website. Um, so this comes the, uh, to the end of the first session. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the session and learned as much as I did. Uh, once again, please join me in thanking our esteemed guests, um, Dr. Dirk Varuman, Professor Ram, and Professor Maduri. Thank you so much once again for all your time and all your information sharing. For the rest of the audience listening in, I thank you so much for tuning in. All tracks are also recorded and will be accessible online even after the conference is over. For those with lingering questions, we are going to pull uh, off all these from the Q&A session and we'll get them out to our speakers. And uh, when the answers are given, we will post on our website. I hope you will enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, feel free to join other tracks and I wish you a very pleasant afternoon.